Hello and welcome to today's webinar. The title of our session today is Closing Often Missed Vulnerabilities That Leave Organizations Exposed. And I'm lucky enough to be together with a couple of my friends from SecPod today. So we'll start out with some introductions. My name is Dave Gruber. I am a principal analyst with the Enterprise Strategy Group. And I'll be hosting today's session. I'll also be sharing a fair amount of primary research uh, that we do here at the Enterprise Strategy Group. And I'll ask my, uh, my two co-presenters, Chandra, to introduce themselves. Chandra? Thank you, Grip. <clears throat> Hey everyone, uh, good morning and good evening. My name is Chandra. I am the CEO and founder of SecPod. Hi everybody, my name is Preeti and I am the director um, and chief architect and I also lead the tech R&D at SecPod. Excellent, well welcome my friends. Uh, I look forward to a rich conversation today. So let's cover our agenda. Uh, we're gonna start out by talking a bit about IT and security posture. And uh, for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time on this subject, uh, we'll make sure that we explain uh, exactly what we mean by those subjects. And we're gonna dig actually pretty deep into it and, uh, and talk about not only some of the situation in the industry today, some of the challenges, and then some strategies to overcome some of those challenges uh, to strengthen that posture for you and your organizations. I'm going to provide an industry perspective, and that'll be based on research uh, that I do as part of uh, my industry analyst role. We'll also be talking about how to keep up with a perspective on uh, the growing and changing tax surface that we're all faced with defending today. Uh, the complexity uh, of the modern attack surface has certainly um, increased significantly in recent uh, few years. And so we'll dig into what some of the challenges are and how we can approach that. We will talk uh, in a fair amount of detail about uh, specific security strategies and, um, and a notion I call the threat funnel. I'll get into that a little bit later. And then our friends from SecPod um, have been hard at work innovating and, uh, and so we'd like to introduce uh, their approach to helping you improve, increase, and strengthen your security posture in your organization based on some of the new innovative things that they've done. Then we'll make sure that we save a little bit of time at the end of the session too to do uh, questions and answers. There is a Q&A um, window in the uh, side of your uh, your. Um, your Bright Talk viewer here. So uh, be sure to click the little question mark. If you do have questions, you can add questions in and we'll make sure that uh, we answer those either along the way. Uh, we may answer them at the end of the session. And if we don't get to all of your questions, we'll be sure to email a response uh, back to you so all of the questions today get answered. So let's start, start out with a basic definition about IT security posture and what that's all about. I pulled this directly from uh, a, a formal NIST definition just to, to work with a standardized uh, view of security posture. So we think of security posture, we think about the security posture is an, basically an assessment or a status of the collective IT infrastructure, uh, so that's networks, information systems, uh, and all the resources, so people process technology that's associated with that, and you're and using that collectively to manage the defense of your particular organization and to react uh, to events and activities as they happen. So, so there's a lot of talk and, and use of the term security posture, improving your security posture, how good is your security posture? And what we're really trying to assess is the, the collective aspects of your IT and security programs and how ready you are, how prepared you are to defend against potential attacks, attackers, um, and then how efficient and effective that process is. So, so that's my sort of layman's high level definition of security posture versus this formal definition from NIST. So we're gonna be talking about um, various uh, aspects of security posture in today's session and um, and how we can leverage those. Now, I wanted to start out uh, by summarizing some high-level takeaways uh, from recent research that I've been doing uh, in the industry. And, and I just want to start out by saying the notion of security hygiene and posture management remains one of the least mature areas of cybersecurity. And when we think about 
the kinds of investments and uh, and technologies and tools and processes that we tend to focus on as security professionals. We tend to focus on a lot of preventative technologies, so basic security controls across each threat vector within the organization. We tend to spend a fair amount of time on core security operations functions, so how to handle uh, alert triage, uh, in investigation, uh, detection and response type functions. We tend to have siloed uh, functions that look at vulnerability assessment within our organization and other types of attack assessment as well. And then um, remediation uh, of the of vulnerabilities and, and very specific to those programs. But when, it, when, we, when we look more holistically at the security hygiene and posture of the entire organization of collectively all the various threat vectors within the, within the organization and and look at that from a risk perspective those programs are are some of the very least uh, mature of any and there's been a recent focus on them which i feel like is really good news there's been a, a sort of a new uh, focus on risk and especially in the second block here around external attack surface management which has been a really hot topic over the last couple of years focusing on what's exposed externally, what risk do I have that's externally facing. So that's taking a narrower view at specific external potential vulnerabilities, external paths for uh, for adversaries to, to gain access to us. But even that is a more of a siloed view of risk and it's not a holistic uh, approach to security hygiene and posture management. The other uh, in big investment area over the last couple of years, too, has been around asset discovery and asset management. Um, there's a there's a strong uh, risk element to that as well. So what are all the assets I'm protecting? Um, you know, a lot of those organizations continue to use the sort of old phrase that says you can't protect what you can't see. So you need to know what it is yet you're you're defending. Um, what uh, what the risk pot and posture profile of those assets are, but again, much of those uh, efforts have been fairly siloed in in their nature and um, and hasn't uh, rolled up to a broad level perspective. Um, on the vulnerability management front, uh, most organizations in in my surveys feel like they have a pretty mature vulnerability management program. Yet when I dig in and ask some hard questions about, uh, about what's really exposed in the organization at any given time, I find that there continues to be a, um, a high level of exposure, a high level of gaps between, um, between when vulnerabilities begin, when they're actually discovered, when they're patched or remediated and that whole cycle still has a bunch of inefficiencies in it and so there's plenty of work that's left to be done on the vulnerability management side of the house which is frankly lagged a bit from some of the other areas in the in the industry um, when we think about uh sort of adding risk into the assert in the security equation in general uh for the most part we're we're looking at point in time assessments so we're looking at either event-based assessments or static assessment activities where, uh, where we're able to say, okay, at this point in time, uh, this is what risk look like. Well, the problem with that is, is that our environment is continuously changing. And in, in, certainly in our, in, our modern, um, in our modern world of uh, heavily cloud-based applications in, in the diverse set of types of uh, applications and and device types we we're utilizing that's in flux all the time. It's constantly changing. So that the the assessment of risks needs to have a more dynamic nature to it, and that dynamic nature then needs to be applied across the broader perspective about um, security posture and and risk management. And then um, and then finally, just in general, there's too many siloed uh, activities going on here at once, and the only roll up point here is to try to push all of these findings into some broader analytics engine. And it's a big heavy lift for most organizations to do so. So there's a lot of integration work that's going on manually um, uh, for people to create automated links to things. So there's a big opportunity for convergence or consolidation of many of these functions to produce a more holistic view on security hygiene and posture management. Let me just take a, a, a breath there for just a minute. Chandra, you've been super focused on, on solving many of the problems that we're talking about here. When you think 
more holistically about the challenges that are associated with this. You, and you see other uh, other security vendors that are focused on these individual areas. Um, so what, what are some of the big standouts for you when it comes to uh, what's missing from the, the current approach? Yeah, I think, uh, say, if someone were to ask me what problems are you trying to solve at SecPod, uh, my one-line answer is always, uh, how do we make how do we make cyber attack prevention uh, make it work, right? So it's not cool anymore. So we need to make it cool. But if someone were to ask me uh, specifics, these are the, the top five or six challenges uh, that I say are kind of highlight that we are at SACPOR trying to work and, and solve each of them uh, holistically, not not point solution, not uh, individual problem that we are looking at. Overall, I mean, if you look at cyber attack prevention through hygiene, these are the problems that stand out and these are the problems that we are day in and day out uh, questioning, identifying a solution, implementing it, and then providing those uh, to our customers. I think that has been our journey so far. Great. Um, let's take a little bit uh, deeper dive on what people are doing today in, on the topic of security hygiene and posture management. Um, in our survey, we asked uh, people about the frequency that they're, um, they're executing these activities. And of course, there's, there's plenty of scan work, there's plenty of assessment uh, automation that's taking place. And here you see uh, the different types of activities on the left-hand side, application security scans, 41% of organizations are doing that daily, 30% are doing that once a week. Vulnerability scans, similar kind of timing, 38% daily, 36% once a week. And so you start to see a pattern of event-driven assessment activities. And, and just in general, when we think about the way we assess things, we think about they're all point in, drive, point in time activities. Um, and that's opposed to many other uh, key activities that we, we do in the security world where we have a continuous state of monitoring that is, uh, that's always current, it's always, re it needs to be, uh, to be defending against attacks that could happen at any given time. So when we, when we look at the world through an, an event-based model, there, it always leaves gaps. And so by definition, there always will be gaps in what we know versus what we don't know versus what's, uh, what's being remediated or what's in process of being remediated. So as IT and security professionals, we have to continually monitor this, this strange window between, oh, we're, we're in, we are assessing now, but we have other remediation act in, actions in play. We have other, uh, other assessment data that we're in the midst of analyzing to make decisions about what we should or shouldn't do. And there's way too many manual steps involved. Even if we're leveraging point pieces of automation to assist in some of these activities, when, when you look at collectively the amount of work and the different types of activities that are required to put this picture together, like again, this is... Um, this is an area that's, that's uh, lagging behind in so many other uh, security, uh, uh, security solutions and security technologies in the industry here. So I just wanted to sort of make that point uh, right up front here in the conversation about sort of why we're focused on solving some of these problems. So, uh, so a piece of the survey that I looked at is um, just in general, how are people feeling about the function of security operations? And, and this is a, a, a fairly broad statement um, about, about uh, is it getting better or is it getting worse? People are continuing to spend a tremendous amount of money. Our research has uh, honestly continued to say that security operations is getting more challenging than it was two years ago. And, and this is uh, data that we've been surveying every year and every year we get the same uh, results, give or take five or 10 points in the survey here. But for the most part, people feel like they're not making good progress. And when we ask people why, uh, the top five reasons were right on the top of the list, very strong, um, a strong uh, priority for everybody was their attack surface. And just the dynamic nature, the, both the growth of it and the diversity of the attack surface. Following closely to that was the threat landscape. Of course, as the adversary, adversary um, takes advantage of this challenged a growing attack surface. They're finding new ways in. They're using uh, more threat vectors collectively, so more sophisticated, more advanced attacks along the way. 
and then uh, more cloud and SaaS usage, which uh, has led to a lot of blind spots for organizations as uh, as SaaS application adoption has skyrocketed over the pandemic years. Um, a lot of IT and security teams don't feel like they have the kind of visibility and control that they want into cloud and SaaS. Um, and so, uh, so organizations, security teams, IT teams have applied yet more tools, creating more siloed uh, islands of data that need to then be um, integrated and assessed collectively. Net net, maybe the most concerning of all was people are so tied up firefighting, they have little time to improve their security program. Digging in just uh, on the number one issue here. So we said, okay, so um, what challenges are specifically were associated with the growing attack surface? And right at the top of the list were more vulnerabilities to manage. Makes sense. I have more assets. I have more types of assets. I have more work when it comes to assessing and prioritizing. More vulnerabilities means means both more volume, more complexity to my world, tougher decisions around risk and prioritization. So I see where that falls at the top of the list. Um, on top of that, my current tools are failing to support this expanded attack surface. So many of the tools that I'm already using simply weren't built to cover off um, the kind of work workloads and the environment that I'm supporting today. And then thirdly, um, the modern application development process uh, uh, has really increased, increased the velocity of application deployment. So things are happening fast. And again, this point in time approach, no longer good enough when things are moving and changing every single day, we need um, a more dynamic infrastructure to support that. So pulling on the vulnerabilities thread a bit more, um, when we asked organizations about their vulnerability management program, we see slightly under half say they have a mature vulnerability program. Um, and then the remaining, uh, the remaining respondents tell us that they have gaps uh, in their program, which is concerning uh, given um, my call out on the top here that the top four uh, leading entry points for successful ransomware attacks were, were from software and configuration vulnerabilities, which might be a surprise to some of you. Uh, oftentimes people think that ransomware um, typically shows up through, through an email phishing attack or some other uh, and user related uh, um, avenue. But, uh, but in my ransomware research that I, I did at the beginning of last year, I, I was frankly surprised to see that these were the top four entry points for successful ransomware attacks as well. So given the sort of the, there's a dichotomy here between um, what people are feeling about their programs, like we're doing our best. We think we have a mature program in place. We're, we're using a, the tools the way they were designed to be used yet I'm still not able to keep up. And Chandra, to your point, I'm not able to defend my organization properly, yet I'm doing all the things that I think that I'm supposed to be doing, which poses a huge question for me. It's like, so so where is the issue here? So, so we got a, a bunch of security vendors that are working hard to solve problems. We have a, we have a fair amount of fairly mature technology. The, the, the vulnerability management, vulnerability assessment, this is not a new topic. We've spent a ton of time and a ton of energy in the industry. Why are organizations continuing to struggle to keep up with this, what seemingly is a fairly mature uh, part of modern IT and security programs? And well, so the data sort of tells the story here. People are just simply struggling with the, the, the sheer volume, right? So we have, we have, a, we have either, either tech or processes that can't scale, right, to the volumes we need to get to. Um, we're struggling with uh, with the automation process, second one on the list here. So we, so part of the scale issue is without the right level of automation, we can't get to where we need to be. We still have um, silos of uh, of um, personnel between IT and security teams, and the prioritization process that goes along with that. So sort of coordinating uh, around across different tools, or coordinating across different teams and people and then just the sheer volume of analysis required uh, to pull all this together. So a lot, and, and, and if, if this is your function, all of these things resonate with you uh, today um, because it, uh, certainly in my conversations and in my research, I continue to see this virtually everywhere. So, uh, so given all of that, let's just sort of take a step back for a second and say, okay, 
monitoring the attack surface. Big task. Chandra Preeti, I'll, I'll ask you to jump in here too. So, so how do we need to rethink or reframe the attack surface? Our, all the different avenues within our estate, how do we need to think differently about defending this collective attack surface? It's super complicated. It's moving all this. I feel like everybody I talk to says the ground is moving underneath me. Like, how am I possibly going to have eyes and know where to focus my time and where, where to go? So, so how do, how do we um, modernize or rethink uh, defending an attack surface that is constantly in motion, that is constantly under attack, and, uh, and that my current tools and technology seemingly lack the ability to scale up to um, in my environment. Yeah, so yeah, I think some of the major questions that we need to ask ourselves is do we understand our environment uh, deeply enough, right? Uh, do we know what is in it? Uh, what is running? Are my security controls running properly? So I feel somewhere visibility is something that is lacking. Um, we don't know what is happening. Chandra, you want to add on to it? Yeah, I think, uh, as Dave said, attack surface is constantly moving. So you have different kinds of uh, devices. People are working from different locations. And uh, heterogeneous environment computing is also changing drastically. So you have uh, different uh, uh, enterprise computing, and then there's cloud computing, and then different kinds of uh, devices and, and are getting constantly added into the, to the scope. So that's where the attack surface is kind of constantly changing. So that's one part of it. The biggest problem is that we don't have visibility into the whole uh, attack surface or, or IT landscape in general. We don't really have a grasp on what is that that we are trying to safeguard. And that is the biggest challenge. Um, we, we bring in CISO and then we say, hey, here is the network, go ahead and secure it. But what is that I'm trying to secure? Where are my devices? Who is using it? Where are they connecting from? And that is at the at a very higher level. But deep inside, what is running in them? Are they permitted to run certain things that are being run? And security posture configuration of these devices, are they configured appropriately? There are so many unknown things that are there, which makes it extremely challenging for uh, cybersecurity administrators to first understand the IT landscape deeply enough and uh, and insight with with really insightful uh, understanding is is required uh, in order to really clean up that environment. So that's number one, and then and going further. Uh, concept of vulnerability or rather definition of vulnerability is kind of misunderstood in my view today most focus on software vulnerabilities maybe you have uh, application software or system software we just try to understand what kind of bugs are there and uh, on those bugs are being exploited uh, by ransomware or malware that is true there's no problem there but there are equally important vulnerabilities which is maybe misconfiguration that you talked about dave earlier and also the privileges, who is using uh, what, the security controls that are already deployed, are they functioning well? Uh, operating system itself provides uh, hundreds of security controls um, to, to efficiently harden the system and also create the right security posture. And, and most of us don't have visibility into to those uh, security controls. So the concept of vulnerability or the definition of vulnerability is, is uh, slightly different than what we understand today. I think that makes it even more challenging. And in the previous slide, you also talked about uh, making a point in time uh, a risk assessment. So again, it doesn't make sense in my view because you need to continuously, uh, I mean, at all time, uh, irrespective of what time, uh, you're supposed to have the risk exposure of the organization. It cannot be a one-time exercise it cannot be a weekly or a monthly exercise anymore. So this that is one another uh, problem that that kind of adds to uh, umpteen number of problems that we have. So when we think about defending this attack surface, so so here's my um, 
my fairly simplistic view about the layers that we put forth in security strategies. And, uh, and I've sort of framed this in the concept of a, what I call a threat funnel, which is um, where, can we, uh, where can we start to reduce the attack surface, reduce the threat uh, by layering a series of different security strategies in play here. And, and admittedly, this is not necessarily um, a sequential process that this is uh, that many of these activities run in parallel. And you could argue that there's a closed loop to, to many of these. But let's take a more simplistic view here for a moment. And by the way, this sort of follows the NIST framework of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover um, in each of these layers. So starting at the top, we've been talking a lot about attack surface. And and Chandra, you just expanded the scope, frankly, of of the big pile of vulnerabilities that most organizations already have to sift through. And you just added a whole bunch of other characteristics that that I totally I wholeheartedly agree with the expanded view on what vulnerable systems actually means. But that that just produces potentially more issues that need to be assessed, prioritized, remediated. Right. So it's it's that. The top of this funnel, you know, only fits on this little slide here, but there's a tremendous amount of, of, uh, I'll, I'll call them just on simple terms, alerts, right? So like, hey, you need security professional, IT professional, you need to pay attention. There's something that's not potentially correct here. Go do something about it. Um, that makes my head explode just based on the amount of input that you have uh, going into this. And so... We want to do as much of that up front as we can to, to sort of knock off in an automated fashion as much discovery, assessment, remediation type activities in more of a continuous fashion so that then our active security controls have less work to do, right? So if we can reduce the attack surface up front and, and by identifying not only what we have, but what potential deviations to what's expected, um, is in the top. And then uh, when we're defending actively against all the individual threat vectors, uh, of course, one, we need these pieces and parts to work collaboratively. So they have to work together to inform each other so that we are able to protect properly. And if we do a better job in layer two here in the protect category, then we have less work to do on the detection and response front, which frankly is a, is a the, the more automation we can do in the first two layers, the, the less human uh, inter intervention that we have to put forth for detection and response. So that you know, sort of given the cybersecurity skills shortage that we have today, we want to try to minimize that as much as possible. And then, of course, the better job we do there, the less time we spend on, on uh, successful incident response activities. And hopefully we don't end up in a recovery situation. But uh, we all know that in many cases uh, we land there with some small number of activities. So, so just to sort of set up the conversation that, that I, that it, admittedly there's a, a number of uh, defense in depth type activities that need to take place. There are multiple security strategies that we need to focus on. So the question is, how do we leverage this top layer and get as much uh, protection from this this top layer in the equation here as possible. Well, let me just point out here that um, there's been a tremendous amount of activity over the last several years now, shifting to a behavioral threat to threat detection model, a more informed, more intelligent level of automation being applied to these two layers, to, to protection and detection. There's been a tremendous investment in machine learning and AI type technology, um, this behavioral associative uh, correlation between different events and activities to try to look for more advanced threats in the equation. I would also wager to say um, at the top layer, the super important layer in the equation, this is really lagged when it's come to applying more advanced uh, automated approaches to speed up and become more effective at reducing this most critical part of the threat funnel. And, um, and as, as we've been talking about, most of the, the, even the automated approaches that are here have been focused on more static event-based approaches, which have left a tremendous amount of work to the human side of the equation, to our security analysts, our IT analysts, um, uh, that then uh, find themselves overwhelmed by just the, the volume 
of work that they need to do. So uh, more help is needed. SecPod uh, has been working on this particular area. And I'd like to ask uh, both Chandra and Preeti to tell us a bit about how they've been now focusing on applying some of these more advanced techniques that have been used in other areas to this super critical layer. Thank you. Yeah, so this is what we've been doing uh, at SecPod. Uh, how do we redefine cyber attack prevention strategy, right? So there are a couple of points that I want to touch upon there uh, in, in your previous slide, uh, Dave. So obviously, uh, there's a significant amount of innovation happening uh, in this particular area. So we really need to focus here. And that is the, the point that we made. Also, Prior to this, you also brought up one uh, significantly important point. There are more number of vulnerabilities to deal with for organizations and security administrators are really struggling to, to um, after having uncovered so many vulnerabilities, struggling to remediate those. And that is where the prioritization uh, sort of a layer came in. And you still have to deal with so many of those vulnerabilities. Of course, prioritization may tell you that these are the uh, vulnerabilities that you must uh, immediately act upon, but you cannot ignore the rest of them because all of them are also exploitable. Attackers just need one entry point. So everything needs to be dealt with and everything needs to be uh, uh, paid attention to. Of course, making it into a continuous and automated uh, process uh, really comes in handy there. But let me uh, kind of project uh, somewhat of a different uh, perspective here. So in our organization, we kind of discovered that there is one software application uh, and there are, uh, we, we, when we looked at the versions of each of those software application, we found that there are five different uh, version of the same application is being used in, within our own organization. Now, if you look at uh, vulnerability assessment program, so each of them will assess all of these applications and tell you that there are 2000 vulnerabilities in, in just this, this particular application. But how about having that environment kind of cleaned up, right? So if you just had one version of the same application, so you're dividing that by uh, number five, right? So the significant number of these vulnerabilities uh, that are detected, uh, if you, uh, pay real attention to the IT infrastructure, understand the IT infrastructure and clean it up, significant number of those vulnerabilities can be reduced. For example, open ports is one problem that you highlighted previously. And so there are a number of uh, unwanted uh, ports that are uh, listening, whether it's required or not, we don't know, we don't have visibility into it. Are there services that are uh, running when they are not supposed to be running? Is there unused computing? Is there unapproved uh, computing that is uh, lying just there? So these are the things uh, that, that kind of props up uh, when you really uh, question that uh, number of vulnerabilities uh, being huge, right? So that is one uh, significant area that, that one need to pay attention to. Uh, as you rightly said, at SACPOD, we have been uh, paying a great amount of uh, uh, attention to the top layer. How do we make it into a continuous process? How do we make it into an automated process as much as possible? How do we uncover vulnerabilities of different kind? Uh, as I explained, not just a software vulnerability, but going beyond, which are equally important. And also, how do we remediate uh, these vulnerabilities that are discovered uh, within uh, within the soft, same software, if possible? Right. So that. These are some of the questions that we have been asking at SACPOD over several years. And uh, we have uh, come up with this framework. Uh, our product, uh, Sena Now, or rather platform Sena Now, implements each of these layers. Uh, so if you look at vulnerability management, so one is, of course, getting visibility into the IT infrastructure. Um, not visibility at the superficial level, but really going in depth, analyzing each of those uh, parameters uh, and that kind of uh, come out after having a deeper look at the, to the organization's uh, IT infrastructure. 
normalizing the, the infrastructure. So the example that I gave you uh, in SCP, for, for example, is installed uh, with five different versions. There are unwanted services, unwanted applications, unwanted uh, open ports. Maybe there are security controls that are deployed, configured, but not functioning, maybe not configured. So there are hundreds of such questions that one must ask uh, early on in the in the vulnerability management journey and, and normalize the IT environment and then go into the detection and prioritization. Uh, the, the magic that was done with the normalization will help significantly reduce the attack surface, significantly reduce the number of vulnerabilities that, are, that you're going to be discovering in your environment. That will also give us the opportunity to look beyond software vulnerability, uh, not ignore software vulnerability, but also look at other uh, vulnerabilities, right? So misconfigurations can be there. There can be highly critical security patches that are missing. Maybe there are security controls that are uh, deployed, not functioning well. So all of these are equally important vulnerabilities. And then you need to feed that into a prioritization uh, function. And once you have prioritized that, then you feed that uh, information into the remediation layer and then try and make it into an automated and continuous process. So this is what we've been working uh, at SACPOD, uh, making it into an end-to-end -end automatable uh, process. In the last uh, two weeks uh, ago, uh, we kind of launched a new uh, product into the, the platform, which is where uh, I was talking about normalize. So, uh, so this is something that we introduced in, in uh, two weeks ago, uh, a new product that kind of takes a totally different perspective to how we look at the IT environment, how we understand the IT environment. Uh, and, and you also mentioned that um, a lot of innovation is happening in the detection and response layer but nothing much is happening here. Uh, AI is not being used, statistical analysis or computing uh, is not being used, data analytics is not being performed. So this is our answer to that. So Normalize is, is a layer that we introduced uh, recently. I would like to bring in uh, Preeti to talk about that uh, innovation uh, that, that we have uh, you know, made at SACPOP. Thank you, Chandra. So uh, what our IT security teams have today, uh, they would know uh, what hardware they have and what software is installed in them, which is a very limited view, right? And uh, we can look at so many data points from the devices. So um, we can look at what are the kernel versions that are running, uh, what are the processes that are running, services, uh, what are the uh, network ports that are open. So all these data points that we collect from each of the devices can be analyzed. So here there are 100 plus uh, such probes that we look at. Each of them, uh, say on an average, has 10 attributes, becomes 1,000 attributes that we look at. Right, um, and we can give uh, a view of um, how their security posture is. Uh, to um, move forward, uh, I, there are two views that we can see here today, right? So on the left-hand side, we are looking at each device individually. We are trying to see uh, that has an application, it is vulnerable and we need to remediate. Um, and one by one, when we look at these devices, it becomes a very tedious process. Uh, when we look at devices holistically and we put them together, we'll be able to identify uh, some outliers. So if we are collective looking, uh, collectively looking at applications, as Chandra rightly pointed, um, there are some unusual applications that we will be able to see. Some strange firewall configuration, right, that we will be able to see and uh, act upon it. And that's where the concept of outliers have come in into um, our product that we are providing. So Preeti, um, can, I, can I interrupt you just for a quick sec there? Yeah, sure. So, sure. so as a researcher, I deal with uh, a lot of data points all the time uh, mm -hmm. from, for, for different reasons. And one of the activities that I spend a lot of time doing is finding cohorts. So I basically mm -hmm. group my data points in and look for patterns of what I would exactly. expect to be normal or expected behaviors. And then I too, just like you are doing, I look for outliers because outliers always give me uh, special insights into 
uh, into some potential either differences or activities or changes that are going on. I think that's what you're describing here too. Is is yes. you're you're trying to you're following a similar process using a an automated analytics function. Am I right? Yes, that is how it is done. Um, it is uh, a very commonly known concept, right? So uh, when we try to see these outliers, uh, we would want to take actions on it. And um, and that is what our engine is all about. Um, we have broadly classified them into outlier detection. Uh, in uh, We can also apply rules and then apply outliers on it. I'll be coming into uh, those details very soon. I can look at data over time right, over 30 days, and I will probably be able to see something that is looking strange. Um, uh, either your MAC addresses are changing or your ARP settings, you know, you have um, different mapping of IP to MAC address uh, uh, when I look at many devices together. And or I can also look at security control deviations, such as your bit locker, ASLR settings, SE Linux settings. When I look at all these things, and also take user input, right? I try to understand. So this is what I want in my organization to run. These are the services, processes that I want to run. And then there are these strange processes that are running, which I'm, I don't want them to run, right? And all these um, inputs are fed into the engine. And we give a visualization of what are these outliers. Uh, we also try to provide the fix to mitigate these issues. And that goes in into the engine as a feedback where our data set changes now because we have fixed some of the anomalies and we can uh, see potentially new outliers, right, as the data set changes. So this is our computation framework. Um, uh, in general, when we are trying to find outliers, uh, IQR is a very uh, commonly known method. Um, we also have rule-based um, outlier detection where um, uh, if, um, I, I don't know, uh, a sigmoid function, uh, uh, it is not a, um, uh, what do you say, a commonly known uh, thing probably, um, but I will just try to tell you what it is. It performs like an activation function uh, in a machine learning uh, model where their data is not linear, right? So we try to apply that on the DNS cache settings, the current, uh, you know, processes uh, that are running and there are ports that are open. And uh, we try to find out the frequency of these attributes. We try to find out uh, either the risk that it, uh, you know, uh, pro uh, the carries for the organization. We also look at data trend uh, over 30 days. We try to see, generally it should follow in, uh, in a normal curve, but then um, there are some things that might not, uh, you know, fall in that normal curve. So that is X into standard deviation of mean is that what we check. And if it is greater than that, then we mark it as an outlier. We are also able to give confidence saying that this is only there in one device versus it is there in 50 such devices out of 100. So uh, we will be able to give you confidence also. And what this actually brings in is you remove a lot of things that you don't need in the organization. Uh, a sort of clarity comes in, you want to declutter. So as soon as you start removing these applications and you know you don't want these processes to run, automatically your attack surface comes down because uh, now you don't have to remediate those many applications also, right, going forward in the process. So that's what this uh, computation framework promises. So we will be able to give you, um, you know, an attack surface. Uh, so say uh, I, uh, there are multiple 75 plus checks that we have. So each of them falls under some category. So say network or uh, software assets. So how are your anomalies falling in? So you'll be able to see that more of my problems are towards the network side or uh, my software assets side. We'll be able to give you a deep analysis into how each devices, uh, each of the devices are. Also, when I look at them collectively versus uh, uh, when I see them as a single machine. So uh, the confidence also plays a very important role because you'll be able to uh, take better decisions of this anomaly. So if you feel that this is okay to be there, you can whitelist. If you think it is not okay, then you go ahead and fix it. So you probably would want to block an application or uninstall an application. You would want to bring down a process, right, which is running. Uh, so these are some of the examples. Uh, this is a little bit of sneak peek that we have given of what we uh, work on. Um, 
And what is uh, the benefit? See, uh, a security uh, administrator might point out problems, right? A CISO has this uh, great responsibility of uh, ensuring security in an organization. But when it comes to fixing them um, and giving it to IT administrators to fix them, they might not be equipped with the right tools to do that. So that is not something that is cool. So we try to solve all these problems. We try to give the right fix to these anomalies, which means that now you know what is your IT infrastructure like. Uh, you will be able to gain rapid security mileage. You have total control over uh, the anomaly loopholes. So your operational efficiency increases because now you have decluttered and you, there are no uncertainties in the organization. Now you know exactly, I have this in my organization and I, I need to fix these things going forward. Can you describe just for me for a minute about, so if I were to fire up your new capabilities, your CMM capabilities uh, today, um, I feel like I would have all of a sudden a lot of new insights that I didn't have yesterday. And the first thought that comes to mind with that is, wow, I see more, but wow, now I have yet even more work to do than I did when I started, because that that's my big challenge is I just have too many vulnerabilities, too much work to go through them, try to figure them out. You provide an yeah. automated platform that helps simplify that process. Can you just describe that a little bit better for me? Yeah, sure. So um, we also had the same question when we were uh, developing this. So now I'm giving visibility to these many data points. Now, uh, would a person look at it and feel, oh, God, I have so much so many things to do now, right? Um, I have these problems. But then if I'm not giving the right fix, right, and making it easier for people. So for example, if BitLocker is disabled in all the machines, just a button click away, you know, you just select all those devices and you will be able to enable BitLocker or uh, you will be able to enable ASLR uh, settings or a gatekeeper in Mac machines to ensure that only um, trusted software runs in your organization. Uh, you can block an application or you can uninstall, you can stop a process, right? All sorts of 100 plus uh, responses are also mapped. Um, so if this is the problem, these are the actions that you can possibly take. If you're okay with it, you know, just a, a click away, you can just whitelist it. Uh, these are some of the easy things that we have given in the platform that makes, us, makes it easier for administrators to go ahead and Take those actions. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And one last question that I have um, just before you wrap up is when you think about deviation, is there a, should I assume that at any given time that a 10% deviation from what's expected is okay? Is there, is there a way for me to say uh, anytime it gets more than 10% deviation from what the expected environment is, I should, I should, you know, red alert it, it like now when something is afar, uh, or should I, am I targeting zero or like, where am I targeting and on deviation from what's expected? So the threshold here uh, totally depends on how many devices we are looking at and what are the data points that we have. So we compute threshold based on the number of devices that we are looking at. It's not just 10%. Uh, out of 100, it could be five is the threshold that we can probably look at. Or uh, if it's a large an organization, right? The threshold changes automatically and they don't need to do anything, right? Uh, the uh, machine learning um, algorithm that we have developed automatically takes care of. So you just need to see, you will be fascinated when you see what it can discover because I have seen that uh, on our customers when they saw, oh God, I have this VPN software installed or I was supposed to use only these collaboration uh, applications, but uh, what is this collaboration application doing, right? Why do I have gaming applications installed in my office laptop? You know, these are some of the revelations that will fascinate. Probably it's, it won't come when you look at devices individually, but when I show it and I say, yes, you can uninstall it, just a click away is the ease that we want to provide to everybody who is using our product. Excellent. All right, thank you. That was, um, I'm, I'm super excited about the potential uh, of what you guys have put in the market here. I'm anxious to hear uh, initial uh, value from, from this capability. It feels like this is exactly what we need in the industry. And uh, we'll be anxious to see how your early customers 
uh, are gaining value and helping scale up their organization and at the same time reduce both attack surface and strengthen security posture for the organization. Chandra, I'll ask you just to sort of wrap up for us here and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, any final takeaways uh, for what you believe the potential uh, uh, for value for your new solution is and uh, maybe make it as tangible as you can. Does this mean I'm going to eventually have, I'm going to have less, uh, I'm going to have less breach. I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to be able to do more with my current resources on my team. Um, what are like, the, if you, if you boil it up at like the big, so what, what are my takeaways? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge that we are uh, working towards, uh, Dave, is uh, how do we prevent attacks from occurring? Uh, of course, it is it's not something that is uh, measurable, so we don't have a quantifying number or a equation that is out there saying, hey, here are the attacks that are prevented because you have these measures. But what we are trying to do is basically give that insight, uh, put it out there uh, for, for security administrators to see and with the new product that we have launched, uh, the CPAM that we talked about, so people are able to really recognize those uh, uh, risk exposures that are out there. Uh, some of these uh, early customers that we have had opportunity to demonstrate, uh, they were kind of uh, wondering how these uh, uh, findings were missed out uh, previously. This is something that we did not pay attention to. So this is something that is easily uh, you know, uh, recognizable as a risk exposure. So that is number one. Uh, of course, uh, resource efficiency uh, through uh, automation. So that's another uh, biggest promise that we make uh, to our customers, uh, making it into a continuous and automated process. You, you don't have to invest too many uh, resources and you don't have to invest in buying multiple point products and, and dealing with uh, each of them, uh, onboarding, deployment, vendor uh, processes that, that have come up because of the, the supply chain attack uh, that has gained uh, popularity. So there are a number of benefits that way uh, when you have integrated into, into a, a unified console and uh, take you through that uh, journey of uh, providing visibility into the IT infrastructure, uh, deeper insight into what is going on and, and ability to normalize the infrastructure and then detecting, prioritizing, remediating, all of these are coming together into one single console. So that uh, operational efficiency, resource efficiency will, will, will be drastically improved. Total cost of ownership is something that, that uh, is going to be uh, significantly lower. But above all this, it is, uh, it is my security posture. I'm able to establish that effective uh, cyber hygiene uh, posture today uh, because of the signification and uh, some of the innovation that we have done. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's let's uh, let's take some questions, uh, if I may. Um, I'll try to field the questions that have come in. Uh, the, the first one is I'm, I'm running other technology in my stack to perform uh, some related functions today. Can I deploy SecPod uh, Along, uh, as it says, alongside of my existing technology to gain uh, an initial insight uh, to what additional vulnerabilities may exist within my environment. Yes, yes, our platform can be uh, coexisting with other uh, solutions that are out there. Uh, it is modular also, uh, so we have six different products that it, that are uh, that have come together onto a single console. But at the same time, customers have the option to choose a specific use case that they want to address uh, uh, on priority. So, or, or they may have invested in uh, certain solutions uh, which are already giving them uh, what they're looking for. But in addition to that, here are those additional components that you can turn on and uh, coexist uh, within that environment. It is, it is possible to do that. Got it. Great. And here's a really simple one. How is this product licensed? The product is licensed uh, per device on an annual, annual subscription basis. Uh, and there are six different products, so whichever product that our customers choose uh, and the number of devices that uh, need to be uh, secured within the organization. 
Uh, we do have a SaaS based uh, deployment as well as an on premise deployment for uh, customers' preference. Excellent, excellent. And then um, this one's about uh, the implementation process. It's like, uh, how do I, uh, how do I deploy? What what's the initial uh, implementation plan look like? Yeah, so um, it's a SaaS based solution. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward, easy to onboard. Uh, typically, we onboard customers within an hour time if, if you choose to go with an on premise or uh, cloud based uh, offering. Uh, pretty easy to onboard, simple to implement, and simple to you know, you know, really see that uh, risk exposure be within the first five to 10 minutes of deployment. So that is where uh, it becomes really, really interesting. As soon as you onboard, uh, within about five minutes to 10 minutes time, uh, you have a holistic uh, visibility into the risk exposure. And at the same time, you have those controls that you can start deploying uh, within the first few hours. Great. That looks like that's the list of our questions. I, I'd like to thank you, Chandra. Thank you, Preeti, very much for joining me in this discussion. I hope this was informative for everybody. If you'd like to learn more about what SecPod is doing, uh, you can uh, use the URL that's listed here in front of us. Go to secpod.com um, or email info at secpod.com. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Always a pleasure.